Indy 500 Films presents the legends of the Brickyard. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome to another show in our series, Legends of the Brickyard. The decade of the 80s kicked off with two drivers scoring their third Indianapolis 500 victories. In 1980, it was Johnny Rutherford. The following year, Bobby Unzer joined his younger brother, Al, in that elite three-time winner's club. Before the decade closed, Rick Mears had pulled off the hat trick as well, while Al Unzer joined A.J. Foyt as the only four-time champion. During the 80s, Lady Luck also chose to smile in a different way on Tom Sneva. Long known as the gas man for his record-shattering qualification runs that broke both the 200 and 210 mile an hour barriers, Sneva finally shed his bridesmaid label and captured his first Indianapolis 500 title in 1983. Then in 1985, an ex-New York taxi cab driver by the name of Danny Sullivan put his street savvy to good use in winning his first 500 crown in dramatic fashion over Mario Andretti. And just a year later, the true sports team with driver Bobby Rahal at the helm scored an emotional win for owner Jim Truman, who died of cancer just two weeks after his team's victory. So how would the decade come to a close? Would a former champion rise to the top again and add to his growing legend? Or would a newcomer etch his name in the record books for the first time? Well, stay with us as we look back at the 1989 Indianapolis 500. The familiar parades of color, the rhythms of old brickyard tradition return on opening day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as 78 cars take to the track in pursuit of a familiar dream, victory in this, the 73rd Indianapolis 500. A new repaved track greets drivers and speeds quickly soar over 220 miles an hour. But throughout the month, some are forced to pay the price as they run over the outer edge of control. Scotsman Jim Crawford suffers suspension failure and the hard reality of an unforgiving concrete wall. 1985 Indy winner Danny Sullivan fractures his right arm in a similar turn three crash. The month of May marches on. So is the weather. Drivers and crews scurry for cover as rain washes out opening day qualifying for the first time since 1983. Brighter skies greet spectators one day later, and the grandstands are filled in anticipation of a record-breaking day. Michael Andretti's Lola Chevrolet is one of the first cars to roll out. Michael, along with his dad Mario, are the first father-son teammates ever to race at Indy. Four-time winner Al Unser Sr. is the first to pull away for a qualifying attempt. The crowd is not to be disappointed as he sets track records on each of his four laps and qualifies at an average speed of 223.471 miles an hour. The man who is the odds-on favorite to capture the pole, three-time Indy winner Rick Mears, prepares for his assault on the record books. The pit crowd maneuvers for position. They know that Mears has already blistered this new smooth track in practice and continues to set the pace with a record-breaking four-lap average of 223.885 and a one-lap mark of 224.254 miles an hour. Rick Mears becomes the first driver to win five pole positions at Indy. Jim Crawford qualifies his Buick fourth fastest, breaking Scott Brayton's short-lived record at a speed over 221 miles an hour. Tom Sneva ups the ante even more in his stock block power plant. But after a first lap record of 223.176, Sneva blows his engine and must now wait until another day to complete his run. 
Two-time winner Gordon Johncock qualifies at over 215 miles an hour. Good for an eighth-row starting spot. But there is a concern about starting that far back in the field. Don't worry about what's in front of me. I worry about what's behind me. The guys coming from behind, sometimes they really don't pay attention to, to what they're doing. And the first thing you know, you get hit from behind. Emerson Fittipaldi's sixth qualifying run at Indy turns out to be his finest. As his 222.329 mile an hour average puts him on the outside of the front row. 1986 winner Bobby Rahal blew an engine in practice on pole day morning but uses an untested Cosworth to secure the inside position of the third row. 26 cars qualified on the first weekend. As qualifying days wear down to hours and then to final minutes, dreams of Indy victory continue for those who have made the field. For those who haven't, dreams become more desperate. For some drivers, there will be additional challenges to overcome. Nine days after hitting the wall in turn three and suffering a broken right arm, Danny Sullivan is back. With only three days of limited testing, he turns in a solid qualifying performance. But now must face the question, can that fractured arm endure the pounding of 500 miles? Sprint car veteran Rich Vogler moves out for his last qualifying attempt and for the second straight year bumps a former winner from the field. Last year it was Gordon Johncock. This year it's Johnny Rutherford. With less than two minutes remaining, Rutherford gets one more chance at his 25th Indy start in an A.J. Foyt backup car. But after a warm-up lap over 217 miles an hour, the engine blows in turn one. And three-time winner Rutherford is on the sidelines. But for pole winner Rick Mears, he walks away $100,000 richer. He is the one of, of our first PPD Bowl Award. Thank you very much, I'm not going to do anything any different than uh, what we've always done here. Just try to keep it as another race on another track. It's difficult to do sometimes, but, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that's helped us over the years here is try to stay calm and relaxed about it and not think about it so much. So that's really what we're doing, just kind of try to lay back a little bit and relax. With the race to make the field now over, crews search for every little edge they can find. In the annual Miller Pit Stop Contest, the Haviland crew of Mario Andretti and the Valvoline team of Al Unser Jr. square off in the final elimination run. The Rick Gallus Al Unser Jr. team are flawless in their performance as they defeat the Paul Newman Carl Haas team and capture the coveted title as the fastest pit crew at Indy, along with a check for $25,000. Not bad for 14 seconds of work. By winning the pit stop competition, Allenzer Jr. had just improved his chances for a good race finish. Of the previous winners, eight had gone on to a top 10 finish in the 500. But only two of those, Bobby Unzer and Danny Sullivan, won both the pit stop competition and the race in the same year. 73 years, one day in May brings America to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Amidst the pageantry of bands, royalty, and the vice president, Dan Quayle, race day, 1989, begins. 33 cars, meticulously cared for, stand ready. As they are carefully maneuvered to their starting places on the grid, the minds of 33 men are focused on one thought, winning. But for a rookie, the first time he walks through the tunnel and witnesses the awesome magnitude of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it is a humbling and intimidating experience. Boy, it's, um, it's so many things, it's hard to put into words. It's everything and more that you ever thought it could be. I mean, exciting, nerve-wracking, uh, intimidating. I mean, all those people and all that excitement and just, you know, just gives you goosebumps. It's, it's amazing to me. I mean, even when you drive up on, on 16th Street out there, I mean, just seeing those permanent stands that sit there all year round and, and just thinking that this place is going to be full for the race. I guess now it's more anticipation uh, in terms of some good things happening when you're a rookie. Uh, I mean, you're intimidated when you walk out there, and you're still, you're not intimidated now, but obviously the butterflies are, are in your stomach, and I don't think that's changed for anybody, no matter how long they, they've been here. In ritual patterns that have become traditions over the years, the countdown begins. The drivers enter the arena. The sleeping giant known as Indy has awakened. The electricity in the air jolts the senses. The noise becomes intense. The tension begins to build as drivers slowly get ready, slowly prepare for the greatest motorsports event in the world. snarl 
to life. Crews stand at the ready, and drivers try and control the adrenaline rush as the Pontiac Trans Am pace car leads the field away. A month of preparation comes down to this moment and the next three hours that follow. and he is pushed back to the pits. Starting is also a problem for Scott Brayton, who finally gets cranked up and moves out to catch up with the field. But already, hearts are broken. Gary Bettenhausen is out, the victim of a broken camshaft. The crowd roars as the cars move through turn four and on to the straightaway. is underway. It's Emerson Fittipaldi who darts into the lead from his outside front row starting position. Pole sitter Rick Mears settles into second and begins to give chase. Mears ties an Indy 500 record as this is his ninth start in 12 tries from a front row position. one star Emerson Fittipaldi leads lap one and sets a new first lap speed mark of 209.2 miles an hour. Piloting a PC-18 Chevrolet purchased from Roger Penske by Wildcatter Pat Patrick of Michigan, Fittipaldi is setting a torrid pace as he builds a dominant lead over the rest of the field. But this is a 500-mile race, 200 laps, and there is a long way to go. Fittipaldi continues to stretch his lead and stand on the gas as he establishes a new two-lap average speed record of 211.563 miles an hour, and his speed continues to go up. The rest of the field jockeys for position while they try to keep Emerson in sight. for third, Mario Andretti, who started fifth, drives low under four-time winner Alan Sr. and moves up a notch. Andretti's Lola Chevrolet has been a strong, consistent performer all month. Out of turn four, Kevin Kogan out of control. As the battered remains of a $300,000 race car come to a halt, pit crews scramble over the pit wall trying to assist. Miraculously, a shaken Kevin Kogan slithers out on his own power, only to look back on the shattered remnants of a once proud racing machine. It's a chilling crash and a reminder to drivers as they maneuver through the debris of the consequence that can result when equipment fails or concentration lapses. Of the three drivers who had trouble on the starting grid, only Gary Bettenhausen failed to complete a single lap for the first time in 17 500s. It also marked the second year in a row that a Bettenhausen finished last. His brother, Tony, failed to turn a lap in 1988. But for the other two drivers, Scott Brayton and Rocky Moran, each went on to score a career-best finish at Indy with a sixth and... Back under green, Emerson Fittipaldi continues his domination, but Rick Mears and Bobby Rahal have closed the gap. But this is the only time either driver makes a serious charge on this Sunday afternoon. The attrition rate climbs by one on lap 24 as Teo Fabi retires the Quaker State portion, the fourth driver to fall by the wayside. The field gets a break from the frantic Fittipaldi pace on lap 35 when he pits the Marlboro number 20. Driving smooth and steady, Mario Andretti inherits the lead. Fittipaldi scorches the pavement, leaving the pits as he unleashes the reins of his 700-horsepower Chevrolet. Andretti makes his scheduled pit stop one lap later and hands the lead over to Raul Boisel. He becomes the 144th driver ever to lead the Indianapolis 500. The month of May has not been kind to 1985 winner Danny Sullivan, whose broken arm was never a factor when he was forced to retire with a broken clutch 
1983 winner Tom Sneva's car is retired. And another former winner slows to a stop. Bobby Rahal brings out the second caution flag of the day with a valve problem. Three former winners, all retired within laps of each other. Michael Andretti takes this opportunity to replenish his thirsty machine. Back under green, Fittipaldi tries to put more distance on his closest pursuer, Michael Andretti. Hanging close with the top two runners is another second-generation driver, Allinger Jr., who started eighth as he puts Davy Jones down another lap. On lap 68, the Penske team suffers its second blow of the day as Allinger Sr. slows with a malfunctioning clutch, another 500 champion on the sidelines. But for Emerson Fittipaldi, everything is just fine, thank you, as he continues to carve his way into the record books. Fittipaldi sets a new race day one-lap record of 222.469 miles an hour, just 11 thousandths of a second slower than his fastest qualifying time. The 42-year-old Brazilian is flying. When Fittipaldi pits again on lap 88, Michael Andretti inherits the lead. It marks the first time in history that both a father and son have led the same Indy 500. But it was a short-lived honor as Michael heads for service. The final blow to the proud Penske dynasty is dealt on lap 113 as Rick Mears is out. Frustration continues for others as well. Ari Leyendijk brings out the third caution of the day with a blown engine. Suddenly, pit road becomes a very busy service station as drivers and crews take this opportunity to tend to their machines. Raul Boisel spins while entering his pits. back underway, Emerson Fittipaldi leaves, but his rearview mirror is filled with the number six Lola of Michael Andretti. But there is also another second generation driver, Allinger Jr., who is also in hot pursuit. Car 12, Didier Taze is done for the day. Down the back chute, Andretti darts underneath Fittipaldi, and they're side by side, entering turn three, Michael grabs the number one spot. Fittipaldi has been turning laps in excess of 220 miles an hour, and suddenly he's struggling to keep up. The Andretti luck continues at Indy as Michael detonates an engine down the front chute. The race is winding down with just 20 laps to go. It's Fittipaldi in first, followed by Unser Jr., Bosell, Mario Andretti, and A.J. Ford. Emerson continues to lead, but low fuel and an ill-handling machine has slowed his pace. An errant wheel from Terrell Pomroth's car brings out caution flag number six. Fittipaldi completes his final stop of the day, but the car balks as he heads out of the pits. He keeps the engine alive and moves down pit road, narrowly avoids an emergency truck, and gets back in line just ahead of Allenzer Jr., whose team chose not to pit, taking a chance that they have enough fuel to go the distance. In the pits, the drama is also being played out. With precious time wearing thin, Unzer is running three miles an hour faster than his qualifying speed, trying to put the pressure on Fittipaldi. He tests Fittipaldi, but the door is closed. It's standing room only at Indy as the two cars scream toward the back chute. Four laps to go. Fittipaldi will not give in. Four laps to go, and Al Unzer will not be denied. Down the back chute. Unzer tests him again. Drop low. Pulls alongside, and entering turn three leads the Indianapolis 500, sending his crew, whose fate now rests with their driver, alone into ecstasy. But you don't become a world champion by settling for second place. Down the front chute, Unzer weaves in an attempt to shake Fittipaldi, but Emerson hangs on. The crew can do nothing more than cheer them on. A million dollars for first place is up for grabs, but only one thing is on the minds of these two veterans. Winning. Helpless. The only thing left for Teresa Fittipaldi is to pray. Unzer's using every bit of the racetrack as Fittipaldi's trying to size up his competition. Once again, down the front chute, Unzer takes no line as Fittipaldi struggles to find an opening. The laps are running out, just two to go. The crews watch as the crowd roars. The two front runners pull up on slower traffic in turn two. As Unzer pulls low, Fittipaldi goes lower. They're side by side. Turn three, they touch. Fate is written in 
the faces of victorious wife Teresa Fittipaldi and in the devastated reaction of Al Jr.'s wife, Shelley. Al Unser Jr. salutes Emerson Fittipaldi's hard-driven, well-earned victory. With the yellow flag choking off the last lap dash to the finish, Fittipaldi takes the checkered flag. In the last 50 years, 1989 was only the second time the final lap was run under caution for something other than rain. The only other time that happened, 1988, debris brought out the yellow light on lap 198 and secured Rick Mears' third triumph. Two-time world driving champion, this is his sweetest racing prize. A disconsolate crew gathers themselves together and then turns to congratulate the winning crew in their rush to victory. Emerson Fittipaldi pulls into victory lane amid a throng of well-wishers. It's car owner Pat Patrick's third Indy 500 victory, and the celebration begins. Bernard Jourdain and Scott Pruitt are voted co-rookies of this year's race, finishing ninth and tenth, respectively. For second-place finisher Allen Jr., the third turn incident was just a racing accident. In racing, there's times that... Uh that you don't think about life, you don't think about money, you don't think about anything except winning. When I was entering turn three, nothing meant more to me than to go into that corner first and come out of it first. It was a race and accident. There were 15 lead changes among five drivers, as Emerson dominated by leading 158 of the 200 laps. The time of the race was just under three hours at an average speed of 167.581 miles an hour. A record $5.7 million purse was awarded with Emerson receiving $1,001,604, becoming the first million dollar winner in the history of the Indianapolis 500. Oh, thank you very much. And, um, uh, this was a great event. I'm very proud to be in Indianapolis, and I want to come back next year. For Emerson Fittipaldi, the Indianapolis 500 is a dream that was born in May and never stopped unfolding. Fittipaldi's dream did not stop when the checkered fell at Indy. Boosted by the record purse, he went on to become the first car driver to surpass the $2 million mark in season earnings. He added four more victories during the season to pick up his first IndyCar driving title. In becoming the first foreigner to win at the Brickyard since Graham Hill in 1966, he also became the fourth Formula One champion to win here, joining Hill, Jimmy Clark, and Mario Andretti. Now, despite coming out on the short end of the Turn 3 battle, Al Unser Jr.'s runner-up spot was his best finish in seven tries. It also marked his third top-five finish in the last four years, leaving him a strong favorite for 1990. It was also the career best for Raul Boisel, who came within a hair of having victory land in his lap. And how about A.J. Foyt's fifth-place finish? Well, despite owning almost every career record, that was his only top-five finish of the decade. Well, if 1989 is any indication, the 90s should provide us with even more excitement as the quest for speed and victory continues here in Indianapolis. Be sure to join us again for another Legends of the Brickyard. The Indians take on the Rangers, followed by the Orioles and Angels. A Wednesday night baseball doubleheader tonight. Now, Racehorse Digest is next on ESPN.